The 2013 Champion of Children televised program is made possible by United Way of Central Ohio. Hello and welcome. I'm Fred Angeli, your host and moderator for this 2013 Champion of Children program. We've got a very interesting hour in store for you. We'll begin with a report on efforts underway to revitalize five Columbus neighborhoods. Then I'll be joined by Jeffrey Canada, president and CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone, to discuss his work there and how it might apply to similar initiatives here in Columbus. And to close the program, Janet Jackson, President and CEO of the United Way of Central Ohio, will present this year's Champion of Children awardees. So let's begin. Neighborhoods are important. They, they matter. They're an indicator of a city's health. Over the past 50 years, urban decentralization produced significant declines in population for most of Columbus's core neighborhoods. For the next few minutes, we'll look at five of those neighborhoods and what's being done to make these matter once again. A map of Greater Columbus reveals few surprises. All of the streets are there, points of interest are highlighted, and the many neighborhoods that make up our city are clearly outlined. Here's a different kind of map. It shows the same neighborhoods. However, it is telling us something important about them that an ordinary map doesn't. We call it opportunity mapping. We literally create maps for cities like Columbus to be able to show individuals there who are concerned about um, assets and resources and poor life outcomes. Every blue dot actually represents 25 households in the metropolitan area that has uh, the good fortune of $100,000 in income or more. And by contrast, the yellow dots are also representing 25 households, but households that are living below the poverty level. Take the opportunity map and transpose it onto the ordinary map. The yellow dots dominate five neighborhoods, all near downtown. Linden, the Near East Side, Wineland Park, the South Side, and Franklinton. It deepens our understanding of how it is that uh, life outcomes can be so dramatically different um, for communities or neighborhoods in close proximity to each other. The narrative for each of these five neighborhoods is strikingly similar. All were at one time prosperous and vibrant. As Columbus grew outward, people moved up, income flowed out, businesses relocated, schools closed, and all of the things that make a neighborhood vital gradually disappeared. It took 25, 40, 50 years for some of these neighborhoods to uh, get into the condition that they're in now. So they're not going to just change overnight. It's a very difficult process and it's very difficult work and it's gonna take a long time. To bring these five neighborhoods back, who should be doing the difficult work? Many look to the city. Mayor Michael Coleman says that the city can't possibly do all the work alone. The sustained impact, the sustained value is bringing in partners, that everybody work together. It is those partnerships that are spurring the comeback in each neighborhood. And the key to success rests on understanding what makes a neighborhood thrive, what will sustain it over the years. A neighborhood is a community of living individuals who are surrounded by what we like to talk about at the Kerwin Institute as opportunity structures. Access to quality, nearby health care, routine police patrols, stores and businesses serving the neighborhood, nonprofit organizations that help people find work, help families find needed services, and take care of kids after school. Affordable, modern housing, and most importantly, safe, high-performing schools. These are the opportunity structures a neighborhood must have. In each of the five neighborhoods, public-private partnerships and committed residents are creating opportunities to improve their quality of life. King Lincoln is a neighborhood that was the heart and soul of the African-American community. It was where civics, culture, church, community, and commerce all came together. 
In the 1960s, the I-71 freeway cut the community off from the city. School desegregation caused families to move to other parts of Columbus. The neighborhood wasted away. So in 2004, I said, this is our next big neighborhood. We got to invest. We got to get the ball rolling. We put a stake in the ground in that neighborhood with the focus on rebuilding the Lincoln Theater as the hub, as the catalyst. Today, the King Lincoln District is the center of activity with new businesses nearby as well as new housing. It's a similar story in the nearby Linden neighborhood. Once solidly middle class, its population declined. Schools were closed. Crime rose. One intersection, the Four Corners at 11th and Cleveland Avenues, became notorious for gang violence and shootings. In the late 1990s, Linden began its comeback. Now those Four Corners has uh, office buildings, community centers, restaurant, and a transit center on the other corner. New housing in the area, new infrastructure building up. Uh, still has a lot of work, a lot of challenges, but uh, is making progress. Settlement houses are truly opportunity structures in all the social services they provide. Godman Guild serves the Wineland Park neighborhood with job placement services, adult education, and an after-school program operated in partnership with Columbus City Schools. What our program does is extend the school day and extend the school year for Wineland Park. And for the last two years, we have achieved all of our United Way performance goals for uh, the students that we work with because we've gotten surveys back from teachers that uh, the children that we're working with uh, after school in Wineland Park are starting to appreciate uh, what their education can mean to them. Another success in Wineland Park is the stabilization of housing, the result of a collaborative effort led by the Columbus Foundation. We identified a neighborhood that had the highest crime and the highest levels of poverty, and uh, we decided to make an investment in that neighborhood. Today, there are 400 new units of affordable housing in Wineland Park for those who need public assistance as well as those who can't afford market-rate dwellings. So the stabilization of housing has gone well. The partners are building their first market-rate homes now, so it's, that's been very successful. On Columbus's south side, Nationwide Children's Hospital wanted to expand. It asked the city for infrastructure help, and from that, a partnership was born. If you invest in the area around Children's Hospital with the City of Columbus in partnership for housing, education, and health care, then the combined effort of rebuilding and transforming the Children's Hospital campus will extend into the neighborhood in a big way. And because of that effort, now the area around Children's Hospital is now improved on uh, areas of employment, uh, uh, health care, um, housing, uh, and education. All these things coming together. Further south, businesses who have had a long time stake in the neighborhood are working together to alleviate the effects of high unemployment and poverty. Three families, the Cranes, the Grotes, and the Kellys, are working with the city to create new housing, a clinic, and convert a closed elementary school into an after-school learning center. Columbus's oldest neighborhood is Franklinton, across the river, just west of downtown. It has some opportunity structures, but it needs a catalyst to transform it. Mayor Coleman thinks he has the answer. We need to transform Franklinton into a new, young, professional, creative class district, unlike any other place we have in the city. And we're about the process of redeveloping Franklinton into a really cool, hot, funky place. To remake Franklinton into another short north, the city, in partnership with the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority and private developers, will concentrate on building new housing to begin this neighborhood's transformation. These examples are snapshots of what is taking place in these five neighborhoods that are yellow dots on the opportunity map. Over time, they will need the right mix of opportunity structures to sustain their growth. But there is one structure above all others that will help determine the future of these neighborhoods. Education is the key to everything, key to our city and the key to neighborhoods. 
Well, for years, people have selected where they live based on where their children were going to school. That's common practice, for example, in suburban neighborhoods and used to be common practice in urban areas. Desegregation and busing changed that practice. Fewer children attended school in their neighborhoods. As poverty grew, more children dropped out. School performance lagged. Safe, high-performing schools are essential in each of the five neighborhoods if their revitalization is to succeed. Well, I think the hopeful thing about Columbus, and our mayor, as you know, has, is willing to play a larger role in education, as is the city council. I think what's hopeful there is to integrate what the city's doing in economic development with what district and charter schools are doing to improve the neighborhoods educationally. So education is a solution. It's critical to this transformation in any neighborhood, and it certainly is for every child. Revitalizing these neighborhoods is a complex business. Developing opportunity structures that last will take time and patience. Will it work? Is there a model to look to? That answer can be seen in New York City, where Jeffrey Canada founded the Harlem Children's Zone. Jeffrey Canada understood that these things were connected to each other. And so what was right about that approach and what is critical to any similar effort in a city like Columbus is that we think about this holistically and not simply as an exercise of devoting resources to a particular school on a particular site. It is a school that exists within a web of structures that are going to be relevant to children's outcomes. A web of structures that are all about opportunity for five neighborhoods. Opportunity that will mean a brighter, better future for the families who live in them and their children. I have lived here most of my adult life, and this is one of the most exciting times that I have seen in Columbus's history. I believe that we are at a very positive tipping point. I see a lot of emphasis around helping our neighborhoods to get better, and I see that being done on a level that uh, is bringing um, the forces, the positive forces, to bear on this community. I wouldn't want to live in any other city but Columbus right now because I truly believe that wonderful things are on the horizon for us. As we conducted interviews for the report you just viewed, each of our experts referenced Jeffrey Canada and his work as an inspiration in how to bring a multifaceted approach to child development and improving a neighborhood's quality of life. He founded the Harlem Children's Zone just over 12 years ago. His vision and success has garnered much acclaim. Time Magazine counts him as one of our country's most influential people, and we're pleased to have Jeffrey Canada with us today. Welcome. Good Thank to have you. you here. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. <laughs> well, first question. You really start before birth. You have the baby college for expectant parents and parents up to three years of age to talk with them about reading and maybe move them away from corporal punishment. Then you have advocates for children through your Promise Academies. You have health care, nutritious meals. You work out in the community. You said you're going to change the culture of the community. Um, and you've also said, however, that all these things that you bring to bear on the individual child to make sure they succeed are nothing more than a middle class child would have already, right? That's right. So, so this to me is sort of the uh, keep it simple, stupid kind of, you know, uh, roadmap to fixing communities. We actually know what to do. You look at middle class communities and you just do what they do there. Do they have decent schools? Yes. Do they have safe streets? Yes. Do they have health care for their children? Yes. Dental care? Sure. Counseling? Sure. No one thinks anything about it. Here's one of the problems we have in our communities. We somehow feel that poor children can do as well if we cut some of those things out. So we keep wondering, why do we have to give them that? Can't we just sort of give them school and isn't that enough? And the answer is we would never do that for our own children. So part of the problem is we know what poor children need. They need what our children need. And we think it ex extraordinary when someone provides that. So people look and say, my goodness, Jeff, uh, you, you give them sports and arts, you chess. 
What does chess do for them? I don't know. Uh, you know, <laughs> other people seem to have their kids playing chess and it seems to work out all right, right? So some of this, and you know, some of this is uh, we as parents uh, have a really solid understanding that our young people need challenging, interesting, uh, changing kinds of experiences to help their development. They need health and safety as uh, sort of prerequisites for uh, really successful education learning. And I have been challenging communities to say, let's not try and figure out how we can have distressed communities, broken communities, filthy communities, communities no one else wants to go into, and then try and see what do we need to do to make children successful in there. Let's create normal, everyday uh, you know, communities for our young people that we would all consider middle class. And then let's provide these high quality services for young people. Look, it's not magic. No one thinks because your child has health care, suddenly they're going to read well, right? We still need great schools and we need great teachers. That's part of it. But some of this stuff is pretty fundamental. So, so what are we waiting for? In the words of the documentary, in your words, are we waiting for Superman? What are we waiting for? Here? Well, here, here's, there, there, there are a couple of big issues. One, uh, a decision was made that we tried this and it didn't work, right? Uh, the war on poverty, people say, was a failure. And so there's a real fundamental belief that in these places, nothing works. And so that's one issue. You have a corollary of that, that lots of things that are happening in these communities we're not measuring to see whether or not they're effective. So you have a lot of feel-good conversation that's not uh, producing measurable results. I think you've got to, uh, number one, agree that there is a new science. These, these are new concepts that are proven uh, that we can bring uh, to our community to help redevelop them. Uh, and that is happening in education, and it's also happening in community development. We know you can fix all the buildings you want. If you just fix those buildings and you don't deal with any of the underlying problems and challenges in a community, guess what's going to happen in five years? The buildings are going to look like the old buildings. You've got to do both. It's complex. I have been saying to people, these problems are complex, and people don't want to deal with complexity. They want a simple answer. Can't we just do this? Teenage pregnancy, let's just focus on it and be done. It's not enough. We need to do this very complicated, integrated, holistic approach to educating young people. And that's what I think uh, we've learned in the last 15 or 20 so years. So you need to go out of You said you want to change the culture of the neighborhood, these 97 or so blocks in Harlem. And you send people out into the neighborhood with help with job placement services for adults, help getting people to own their own homes, that's right. and more. Right? That's right, that's right. This is, this is really about changing a culture. Part of what happens, you know, in communities, people feel like they have been abandoned. Uh, they feel like everybody who could get away left, that nobody who can afford to live somewhere else wants to live in their community. And it becomes somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. We went into Harlem when no one thought Harlem could ever be rebuilt. Uh, mayor Giuliani was mayor. They were giving away the property in Harlem. They just said, whoever wants it, come take it, because the city owned all of this property. They didn't know what to do with it. We had been losing population for 30 years, and folks just said the community's broken. We knocked on every door in our 100 blocks and said to folk, we can, as a community, come back, rebuild, clean it up, Right? Uh, get rid of the graffiti, get the trash out of the streets, uh, plant some trees, uh, rebuild our community so it's something we value and the children are growing up feel like it has value. One of the challenges we have, when kids grow up in a place that they think success is defined by leaving, right? That if, if I can be successful in Harlem, then I get to move somewhere else, all of your talent right, begins to migrate to someone else's community. We wanted to change that definition. But if your community looks like a place that no one wants to be in, then kids don't grow up thinking the community has value. So we think you've got you've to do all of this. This is more than just creating a good school. You have to have good schools. But that is not enough. 
You got to have decent housing, but that is not enough. You really got to have this really comprehensive set of support. And can you measure the results? Is it working for the kids in your, your Promise Academies, your charter yep. schools, you've got, yep. you've got kindergarten, you've got grade school, you've got middle school, you've got a high school now. That's right. And you work with them even through whatever college they That's go exactly to. You right. stand by them. That's, right? We stand by them. And this is, so the answer is, yes, it's working. Uh, Roland Fryer, the economist from Harvard, has already published one research paper on us, and he's about to publish a second one. And, and in the first uh, paper, he was really purely academic. He said, if you look at sort of the gains for these kids, uh, it is really closing the achievement gap. And that's, that was his basic, uh, I think, finding in the first paper. The second paper is even more interesting because we've studied the kids now. This is now six years, right? So uh, kids who started with, with us in fifth grade are now in seniors in high school. Uh, they're going to college much higher levels. Teen pregnancy rates dramatically off the charts better uh, than the sort of uh, same random kid that would not be attending uh, our uh, schools. Uh, the incarceration rates dramatically different. All the stuff that we knew, all the stuff that we said, look, if you give these kids a good education, they're not going to end up getting pregnant. They're not going to end up going to jail. They are going to. We have now the data to support all of that. But something more interesting is happening. So uh, when we first started this project, I had maybe 40 kids in college, right? So going to college, if you were in, ha in Harlem, was considered this rare thing. You'd ask kids, you know anybody in college? And they'd say, yeah, I think I know this girl like seven blocks away. I think she went, right? Because who? it wasn't an experience. I have 840 kids in college now. So part of what happens is, right? So this is, but this is, this is what happens. So now when these kids come home for summertime, half of them end up working for me. So they're all in all my middle school, my elementary school programs, right? So then the kids are growing up and my little fourth graders, they're saying like, she goes to college? If she can go to college, I can go to college. I don't know how she got in college, right? It's no longer this sort of fantasy mystery that you don't understand. You see so many kids going to college that it seems like every kid in Harlem is going to college, which means, of course, you're going to college. So part of this is uh, the actual work we're doing with individual kids, but part of it is changing the culture. How is it you get kids to think differently? My kids used to think, if you're from Harlem, you're tough. You hustle. You do what you got to do, right? Never school, education, all of this kind of stuff. That is changing. Now kids are thinking, yeah, I'm from Harlem. Harlem, I'm going to college. We all go to college. That's what we are. That's what we think you got to do in these communities. At the Promise Academy High School, recent graduating class, everybody going to college? Every, we had 100% of our kids going to college. How many kids? 100 there? there were 65 kids in that graduating yeah. class. 100% 100 are going to college. And here it's, here it's look, the, the challenge for our communities. And in, in Harlem, uh, Columbus, uh, this is not a small problem. And one of the issues is that people start thinking about this problem in terms of the personalities of their city, right? So people say the reason things are so bad in Harlem is because of so-and-so. And they point to this one and that one and this other one, this structure. This is happening all over America. The same issues impact in huge numbers of folk. And one of the things we realized, for you to prepare this generation for employment, there is a much higher skill level needed than that was needed 25 years ago. So cities that are gonna compete are gonna educate their kids at a much higher level because that's where the jobs are going to be. So this issue of high school, look, when I first started in my business, even 15 years ago, if you had asked me, I would have said, yeah, get a kid a high school diploma, that's what they need. That's not sufficient anymore. We've got to get these kids in college, college level, college ready, so that they can go out and compete for these jobs. And I think it's a minimum standard now. You know, Jeff, but somebody might say to you, look, Jeff, you've had hundreds of millions of dollars from wealthy contributors. You were talented enough to bring that together. You've got 15 children or less per classroom, at least two adults, sometimes three in a classroom. And it works on a small scale, but let's take the city of Columbus with you know tens of thousands of kids, right? How do you take some of those policies and practices and make them work, work here without that money, without that ability to have 15 cl uh, kid classrooms? Yeah, so, so here's one of the uh, interesting uh, things that I have said to people. Uh, if you look at our cost structure, um, outside of the classroom, we're spending an additional $5,000 per child. And people think that's expensive. 
I have a map in my office that charts the incarceration rates in Manhattan. When you look the same way you were looking at those maps and seeing that yellow and where the, you would see all of these kids going to jails and prisons. And, and I tell people, that's $40,000 a year. No one blinks an eye. People don't blink an eye. We have created a system in this country where we are totally prepared to go to scale on failure. Let that kid fail, I'll pay any amount of money without blinking an eye, and that part of the budget can't be cut. But then people begin to focus on what we can't provide to get kids to succeed. These costs are minimum costs. I understand that, that this is shocking to people, that it actually costs money to save these kids, right? <laughs> that this is, you know, but, but, but we're spending the money. So this is what I tell folks. You look in Harlem, those same circles, you had the circles up there. I love this kind of data because it makes life easy. Those same circles have that have the folks making less money. You're not only paying for incarceration, you're paying for special education, you're paying for emergency rooms, you're paying for all the kind of additional uh, food stamps, welfare benefits, you're paying for all the extra uh, incarceration in mental health, mental hospitals. It's costing us a fortune. These places are one-way drains on tax dollars. We want those kids working. So yes, I'm going to spend my money to get that kid so they can work, and then that kid's going to pay taxes for the rest of their life. And I think that's what these communities have to do. So I challenge communities to reorient their thinking about this. I've been, I've been yelling about a lot of people, not just here in Columbus, but in, at the, on a national level, because I think, we've, I think we're thinking about this the wrong way. It's not like whether or not we can afford to do it. We can't afford not to do it. It's going to bankrupt our cities and our towns. Your analysis, the analysis you just gave, and I know that hundreds of communities have, have, have looked at the Harlem Children's Zone and have even gotten instruction from the Harlem Children's Zone. Is there any other city you could name where this is a success story where people said, yeah, Jeff, we agree with this analysis. We're going to take the money that would ordinarily be diverted into these things that are meaningless and, and, and negative, and we're going to put it the way you would put it and, and enact some of your programs. Any city at all? Sure. We, and the places I would say to go uh, look at, uh, we have a really good uh, promised neighborhoods in uh, Buffalo, New York. Go to Buffalo, you'll see their business community has come together. Uh, Minneapolis, go to Minneapolis, see what they're doing in Minneapolis. They've taken this model, they've carved out their zone, they've decided they're gonna do this work. Uh, interestingly enough, last weekend, um, while the blizzard was happening in New York, I just happened to be in Miami. Don't ask how that worked out. Uh, it worked out fine for me. But, but uh, in, uh, in, my Liberty, in a Liberty City area in Miami, which is sort of like the Harlem of Miami, the community just decided they're going to do two blocks. They said, look, we're not, we're not ready to do 97 blocks. We're going to do two blocks. And you know what? They're doing it. And they've got their blocks. They've got their school. So we have said to people uh, that... Uh, this is one of the things that stopped these initiatives is that people sort of overthink it. Uh, my theory is start small and build the competence and then expand. And I think what you'll find is that uh, over a fairly short period of time, you begin to see measurable results now. And I've got to talk about measurable because this really matters. This is an investment and it has to pay off, right? The deal we made was if we did not produce the results, do not give us the money, right? Because it is an investment, and we think there has to be a return on that investment, and it has to be kids doing well. You know, I wonder where, where cities like Buffalo get the money, though, to do what you did. Buffalo is not doing well. Nope. All the steel factories have yep. left. It's a city that's yep. uh, not prospering. So, and, and some of the money that's used to incarcerate kids, that's state money, not city yep. money. So, so where does Buffalo so get the money there, to do are, what you that's did? A, it's a great question. Uh, the president has decided they're gonna do replications of this effort in the country. And they have uh, a competitive process called Promise Neighborhoods, uh, both Buffalo and Minneapolis won. Uh, and the 12 communities around the country have won implementation grants and about 30 or 35, that's one, that's one planning grants where they're actually planning on doing the work. And the president has said he's committed to supporting this kind of thing and I think that's a terrific way to go. It requires a 50% match. Right, so these are not small initiatives. 
And I guess the average sort of federal grant is somewhere between seven and, and uh, 15 million dollars, and they have to be matched locally. So in each one of those communi communities, the business and philanthropic communities have gotten together to get the match. And I think this is what it takes. It takes a public-private partnership to get this work done. Uh, and we insisted with the Obama administration that there be a private match to this, because I don't think this is, I don't think government will do this with the level of fidelity, right, where you have to admit when things don't work, right, and then you have to fix them. Uh, and, uh, you know, government has a way of sometimes saying things that don't work really do work, uh, and, <laughs> and, and it's not good for, for these communities. So, but people, when they put up their private money, when, when, when philanthropists, and uh, I think uh, individuals put up their private money, they actually want to see real results, and they want to be, uh, hold people accountable, and we think that's part of what makes this necessary. So, so if we went to Buffalo, would we see, as in the Harlem Children's Zone, in the Humboldt Park area, for example, would we see uh, the job centers like you have? Would we see uh, the training and the resources for getting people to own their own homes? Would we, would we see the neighborhood beautification? Would we see the safety monitors in the neighborhood helping kids be safe? Would we see all that? You would see probably 50% of that. In Buffalo, you would see their early childhood center uh, right next to the school that the kids are going to be going to, uh, which is a charter school. You would see the block being redeveloped uh, that that school is on as they begin their beautification efforts. Uh, you would see the connection to middle school, and you would see a college that's involved with them right now. Uh, they've been at it for, you know, two years, so they're not as far along as we are when we've been at it 15 years. But they're making, they're making the same kind of progress, and they're following the same kind of plan, and I think that the thing that's interesting is that they have the data right now of how many kids and where the kids are at and what the kids are doing and what's being successful and what's not, which is, I think is a hallmark of our work. So if the leaders of Columbus came to you, Jeff, and they said, well, you know, what, what can, how do we begin this process? We already have some neighborhood partnerships, as you can see in the sort of, documentary, and uh, good things of. going. What would you say, would you say, uh, get that promised neighborhoods of money? Is that one of the first things to do? Uh, look, and, uh, and how do you raise the money from, from private enterprise? Yeah. Uh, what do you do? Here is one of the things that we have both been trying to do on the national level and trying to do at the local level. Uh, this scale issue is serious. And people are not used to really thinking about big investments in these communities, right? People are thinking, people are very cautious about these kinds of investments. Uh, and folks have said, you know, Jeff, uh, you sort of connected with these wealthy people and they put up this money and that is absolutely true. Uh, but uh, it is not as though there aren't wealthy people in other places uh, in the country, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. So I, I just want to, because that's important, because the question is, and they're, and they're philanthropic, and they're doing things with their money. But when I talk to really wealthy people about why they won't make a big investment in education or social services, they say, because I'm not sure there's any return on that. I, I'll do something modest, but I'm not prepared to risk big money on something that I cannot measure that in the end is going to produce the results. And here, I think, is one of the things that, that we're trying to change this translation. We're trying to say to community groups, be very clear about your outcomes. Uh, say what's going to happen with kids. And so someone, when they come in and you're really asking for a big investment, that they understand that in the end, they're going to get something from this investment. Here's the other thing, and this is a what message. What do they want to get from the investment? I mean, when you first went to yep. wealthy people in Harlem, you had no data at that point to That's know right. that this would be successful. What did they want? What motivated them to give you the money? People thought that maybe Harlem could be turned around. And this was, and they loved New York. See, this is one of the things. I, the people that I, that I that support me, they love New York. They think this is their city, they have been successful, they have been beneficiaries of that city, uh, and they give back to their city. And they see a Harlem community as a place that they felt like is, is not what they wanted New York to be. And the question was, could we help this really disadvantaged part of the city, and wouldn't that make it better for all of New York City? And the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, so I think the people did it. it. It's altruistic, but it's altruism for folks who are actually going to reap the benefit of living in a city that they feel like is coming up. We all remember the bad old city uh, when Harlem was a disaster, and what you would say to people is, don't even go up there. Too dangerous. 
Uh, now, uh, you, one of the biggest problems with Harlem is that the, the real estate prices are going up so high, high that even people with college degrees can't afford to live there. So a lot of folks aren't too happy about what they think we've done in Harlem. Uh, <laughs> but but the, the, the ability to uh, bring, I think, vibrancy back to a community. There's no one, you, you see the tourist in Harlem, you understand business is thriving in Harlem. You, you couldn't find one national chain in Harlem before we started this work. Not one store thought, I don't know why people didn't think folks in Harlem had money, but no one, no stores were there. Now you walk the streets of Harlem, you can't name a national chain that's not on 125th Street or one of the other areas. Commerce is booming, tourists are there, People are eating dinners and going. I mean, it is part of the fabric of New York City and people realize, you know what? This was actually good for our city and not to mention all of these other kids who are now in college who are gonna be part of the next generation growing up in Harlem. So I think this idea, and it's not, the, it's not just in Harlem, people are understanding this. What I've said to folks, if you love your city, if you love your city, this is too big an opportunity for you not to be part of, because you actually could be part of rebuilding the cities. Cities, when, when cities start losing population, right, usually the groups that are, are creating the sense that the city is going in the wrong direction are the very same groups that like the groups in Harlem. When you can stabilize those groups in your community so people begin to feel like, I love when the mayor said, we're creating this funky little thing. Yes, people feel like, hey, that's an exciting place to live. We want to be part of that. And I think that's important for a city like Harlem uh, or like Columbus. So when you, when you approach a, a, a donor, then you're a prospective donor, you're really appealing to their highest instincts and their best instincts. I mean, they're not going to get anything yeah. money-wise out of this. No. this is no, no, no. People, people, I mean, I think that uh, there are two things I have found. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, who are just philanthropic. They really are. They've, they've been successful. They've made it. Uh, usually they're a little older. Not, you have to usually get them after they pass 40. I don't know what that's about, but that, I think as we all get older, we start worrying about whether or not God is going to let us in, and we try and <laughs> balance. Have you found that to be true? I found that to be true. I, I tell <laughs> folks, those young go get them, leave them alone. They're not ready yet. They're in their career thing. But, but, it, but it's true. It's the one thing that separates Americans from Europeans, right? But it's not just European. I've met many Asians that just don't feel like this need to help strangers, right? Like, you know, in Europe, they think it's the government's job. It's not my job. They take my taxes. That's their job. Uh, here in America, uh, people really believe that you should help and that's often through their churches or synagogues or mosques. But one of the challenges we found is that this kind of help uh, really calls for uh, significant dollars. This is not like, give me $5,000, this is gonna make a difference. This is really going to folk and saying, and it's not a single year. This takes time, and you've gotta be in this for a long period of time and make a difference. And I've been just saying, we've gotta change the conversation right, between those people who are working in those communities and those folks who are part of philanthropy, and then you've got to get government to be part of that bargain. President Obama, in his State of the Union message, said, hey, we want, we want guaranteed pre-kindergarten for every yeah. child in America. Yeah. Doable, and over what span of time do you think? This is something I've been uh, yelling about uh, for a long time. Uh, we know that this education race we're in is a global race. We know it's global. We know we're not just competing against children next door in the next community or even in your state. Right now, the kids in Columbus are gonna be competing with children in China. And they're gonna be competing with children in India. And guess where the, the folks from China are coming? They're coming in trying to study the zone. They're trying to figure out how do you get poor kids, right, to be successful. And you know what I've been telling the American policy people? Because they plan to have more college graduates by far than us. They know that this war is not going to be about bauxite and oil and petroleum. It is going to be about intellect and who has the most physicists and who has the most engineers and who has the most scientists. And we're in global competition. So the fact that the president says that we need to get our kids earlier and give them a quality education, I think is in the national interest of this country. And, and I think this is a modest, reasonable proposal. Uh, it, 
everybody's afraid to say it's going to cost some money, right? So I'm going to be the one that, you know, just says it's probably going to cost some money. Uh, but there could not be a better investment in the nation than doing it. Not just for poor kids. We need this across the board in America. Uh, we have to prepare our kids for a higher quality education experience than they're receiving right now. And by the way, here's a dirty little secret. Yeah, the kids are struggling in the hood, but that's not the only place we're failing our kids. In working class and middle class communities, our kids are being failed by huge numbers. And this is a crisis and people are acting as if it's okay. And I don't think it's okay. So I applaud the president for saying this is a national issue. We should do this for all kids. Uh, I think there are a lot of other things we need to do for all kids, like have a longer school year and a more challenging curriculum, but uh, we'll take these one at a time. We have about just about two minutes remaining. Do, do, do you think, Jeff, that we have, uh, I mean, Americans are good-hearted, most of us, but do we have the will to do this? On an, is, this has been, poverty has been festering so long in this country. Are we going to do it? Yeah, this, this, is, this is fascinating to me because I used to think this was somebody else's problem, right? Uh, now that I'm one of the old guys, right, I'm like, this is our problem. And so I look around and I say, if we are really in control of America, uh, who is it that doesn't want to fix this? And you know what I find? I, I haven't found many people. I have found that the political, uh, I think, um, anger in this country, the fact that people are actually rooting against the other side. The Democrats don't want the Republicans to be successful. The Republicans don't want the Democrats to be successful. So nobody's really talking about what we need to do to help this country. I think that's a problem. And it's one that I'm hoping that we're going to see some real leadership uh, that just says some of these things we can argue and debate about. But some of these things are fundamental to the future of this country. And if you love America, I'm not talking about if you wear the flag. And you, I'm talking about if you really love this country, you have to realize that there is this huge demographic shift in America. Suddenly we're having all of these kids who are African-American, Latino, huge numbers of kids being born in this country, Asian kids, and these are going to be the majority of America in 20 years. So if we're not doing good with huge numbers of these kids, we're going to destroy our nation. And so this idea that, and I really believe that in the end, the Democrats, the, the ones who don't agree with the Republicans, I believe they're both patriotic. I mean, I honestly believe that. Uh, fighting over some stuff sometimes that I think people feel very strongly, I think is fine. I don't know anyone who believes that if you do not educate this next generation of kids, that they will be successful. But here's where I think the problem is. I don't think people realize how big this is. I think a lot of people in America think the kids we're talking about are the kids in Harlem. They're not the kids next door. They're not the kids around the corner. And it's only by getting folk to understand that we really are talking about most American kids. And I think we're going to get this appeal to patriotism that says, let's do this for the country. Jeffrey Canada, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, we thank you once again for being with us, sharing your time and your insights. And uh, coming up next, we'll meet the 2013 Champions of Children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of United Way of Central Ohio, Janet Jackson. Good evening. Thank you to Fred Enderly, and thank you, thank you, thank you to the Jeffrey Canada for that inspiring discussion. I don't know of a better way to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Champion of Children than by hearing the insights of one of the most successful Champion of Children in the world. And now it is my privilege to honor our own Central Ohio Champions with the 2013 Champion of Children Awards. These awards recognize the people and organizations 
in our community that are devoted to ensuring that all of our children have the opportunities they need to reach their potential. These champions improve the lives of children and strengthen our community by helping our students achieve success in school and go on to productive careers and yes, lives. Nominations for the awards come from community members and others deeply involved in education. And the honorees are selected by a committee of community leaders who choose people and organizations with a proven record of success, who inspire others to work on behalf of our children. I'll begin tonight by recognizing our individual champion of children. The 2013 champion of children has truly devoted his whole life to serving our children and our community. Jed Morrison has served as the superintendent CEO of the Franklin County Board of Developmental Disabilities since 2000. The board provides early intervention, educational, therapeutic, employment, and residential support services for over 17,000 children and adults who have developmental disabilities, helping them to live, learn, and work in our communities. Prior to his current service as superintendent, Jed was assistant superintendent from 1977 to 2000. And when I say Jed has devoted his whole life to serving others, I mean it. His work with the board began as an instructor and supervisor from 1971 to 1974. He also served as director of the Ohio Special Olympics from 1974 to 1977, where he helped establish a year-round sports and recreation program for children and adults who have intellectual disabilities. Jed's extensive community service includes serving on the Bexley City Council for 12 years. For all he has done for our children, Jed joins a distinguished group of local leaders who have been recognized as champions of children and have made a deep, far-reaching impact on the lives of children in Central Ohio. Please welcome the 2013 champion of children, Jed Morrison. Thank you so much. And uh, first, let me also say congratulations and thanks to Linda Cass for 20 years of Champion of Children and all else that you do for our community. <clears throat> thanks also to Margie Pizzuti for her kind nomination for this award and for the outstanding leadership she provides for Goodwill Columbus. And special thanks to Janet and United Way. You know, it is especially meaningful to me to receive this award from one of the very best rated United Ways in the country. Thank you. I think what is so special about this award is that it, it really is a nice reflection of our community, which recognizes the value of all people, regardless of ability, regardless of disability, and when I say it reflects the community, I mean our entire community, our elected officials, especially our county commissioners and mayor who consistently support our efforts. It's a reflection of our business, our business community, who not only support us, but so many businesses have discovered how hiring a young adult with a disability can add value to their business in so many ways. It is a reflection of the media who help us to educate the community and the capabilities of individuals and services available. It's a reflection of the leadership of our current and past board members. In fact, three of our board members are here tonight, Dean Fidel, our president, Linda Craig, and Beth Savage. 
and especially it's a reflection of those people that actually do the day-to-day -day work. Our partner agencies, the people we serve, their families, and the good work of what I call an awesome staff. I wish I had time to name every one of them as they all deserve a piece of this award. Becky Love, who's our director of early childhood, and doctors from Nationwide Children's Hospital, which is one of our partners, remind us that the greatest amount of brain development occurs in the first three years of life. So the more we can do for young kids, or frankly all kids of all ages, not only will they be better off for the rest of their lives, but their moms and dads, brothers and sisters will also be better off and able to contribute to our communities. And from a public policy perspective, this support in early years means that less service and less cost will be required later. Before I sit down, I'd like to personally acknowledge some of my personal champions who are here. My brother Jim and sister Judy are here with my mom, who at the age of 96, the young age of 96, <laughs> continues to set a great example for all of us her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and she certainly keeps me on my toes. <laughs> and the most important champion of my life and the lives of our children, my wife, Joyce. Thank you. Now, I am excited to present the Champion of Children award to a nonprofit organization. This year's winner is a cornerstone of our education community when it comes to providing children with the mentoring they need to succeed. Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Ohio has served more than 100,000 children since the agency was founded in 1933. It's the third largest Big Brothers Big Sisters agency in the country. And last year alone served 4,000 Central Ohio children through one-to-one -one matches with volunteers and 5,000 children through its mentoring programs at Camp Oti Aqua. It is also well known for its effective community-based and school-based mentoring program, including Project Mentor. We know that mentoring programs improve the lives of mentees and mentors and have helped create generations of successful students. Big Brothers Big Sisters is mentoring at its very best. Please welcome Ed Cohn, President and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Ohio, to accept the Champion of Children Nonprofit Organization Award. Thank you. I've had the privilege of being the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters for the last seven years, and I was on the board of directors for six years prior to that. My prior career for 25 years was in banking, and I had the opportunity to be a bank president for 13 years. And let me tell you, meeting quarterly earnings was easier than dealing with the adversity these children face every day. Big Brothers Big Sisters has a rich 80-year history here in Central Ohio, including the 2001 Champion of Children honoree, Dave Scherner, who is still with the agency and here tonight personally serving kids and their families for over 40 years now. We have the good fortune of mentoring being a highly researched field with extensive studies proving the impact of mentoring. And the continual research also provides us with information that we can utilize to continually improve our programs because as we all know, the times keep changing and we have to stay progressive. Through our awesome volunteer mentors, people like you, and I know many of you in the room who I'm seeing here tonight are mentors, and I assume everybody who's not will call me tomorrow and volunteer. 
uh, through people like you and our amazing professional staff, we inspire kids with hope and a desire to succeed in school and in life. Kids have to be in school because they want to be there and because they believe they can succeed. We then supplement this attachment to school by connecting kids and families with necessary supportive services, such as tutoring or emergency services. Again, through you, connecting a community of organizations, both for-profit and not-for-profit, that provide critical needs to kids and their families to overcome both academic and non-academic barriers. So both of these elements are critical for success. If a student does not want to be in school, they won't succeed. And if they are inspired and do want to be there but can't succeed in their studies, they won't stick with it. It is this heart and mind connection, the cognitive and non-cognitive requirement that can only be achieved with the collective impact of our community. Collective impact includes coordinating the right intervention at the right time, avoiding unintentional duplication, but also means coordinating multiple services with intentionality when needed to create impact. So it's special to receive this recognition tonight, but it's really all about great volunteers and donors, incredible board members, and a caring community coming together for our kids and their families. But honestly, we're really happy that we're getting this award and you voted us this recognition. So thank you, it's great. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to end by thanking everyone who helped make tonight's program a tremendous success. Our special guests, Jeffrey Canada and Fred Anderley for their enlightening discussion. The 2013 Champion of Children televised program is made possible by United Way of Central Ohio.